Good evening, everyone. It's good to see real people in here tonight. Yes, it's great. It was great this morning, too, seeing real folks and real people and real music. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Would you all please stand and join us? And if you're watching us at home on Facebook Live, we're glad you're with us there, too. So, here we go. Here we go. Above all power, above all king, above all. Above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. Above all. Through all this coronavirus stuff, it's real easy to take God for granted and think that uh, we'll be okay. Well, we'll be okay. We will be okay as long as we just put ourselves in His hands and let Him guide us through it all. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one 
that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need Your righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is bound, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand upon you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Like no other, your name 
Let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to save But your name Amen all right, take a moment to walk hand and shake hands, greet your neighbor. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Don't do that. Just kidding. <laughs> just checking, just checking. <laughs> you can bump elbows if you like, yeah, but don't shake hands. Don't get close. Just, just stay where you're at and sing with us. How's that? Just praise the Lord with us. That'll work. <laughs> Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever, for He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. Forever God is with us, forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arms, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. To the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever, God is faithful. Forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. Forever. Amen. We, we want to see, we want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see Jesus lifted high. A banner that flies across this land that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward, little by little taking ground. Every prayer and powerful weapon, strongholds come, tumbling down and down and down and down. We want to see, we want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We're going to see, we're going to see, we're going to see Jesus lifted high. We're going to see, we're going to see, we're going to see Jesus lifted high. Hey Amen. It's such a joy to see Elena clapping and dancing and having fun with that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So glad morning when this life is all high. Fly away to a home on God's special shore. Ah, fly away. Ah, fly away, oh glory. Ah, fly away. Where 
certain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know I know he holds the future and life is worth living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll find life's fine, no war with pain. And then as death gives way to I'll see the lights of glory and I know he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. Life is worth the living just because he lives. Just because he lives. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. Satisfied as long. Mm. Hi, 
go ahead and have a seat. Get comfortable, please. And it's Pastor Paul's turn. Do you have the uh, stand? Oh, stand, brother. Okay. All right, good evening and welcome to 2020. Good music stand. Yeah, it's so. uh, been a long time since we've been able to do what we're doing now, and it's good to see all of you with us tonight. Um, it's uh, kind of neat to see the setup, isn't it? It's a little different. We've got like a whole bunch of different aisles that we, that we used to have, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, easy, it's easy, easier to get around the auditorium. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We've got three questions tonight that we're going to deal with, three topics. Well, thank you very much, Vern. I appreciate it. If we have time to get to them, them all. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And let me read the question that we're going to be addressing uh, first. It is this, 1 Corinthians 7, 14, and let's go ahead and read that. Verse 14 uh, says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So based on that verse, here's the question. 1 Corinthians 7, 14 says that if the child does not have at least one Christian parent present, he is considered unclean. This being said... Would a child without Christian parents be left behind if the rapture were to take place or condemned if they die? Does unclean have a different meaning? Am I correct in assuming that an unbelieving spouse being sanctified by a believing spouse would be through them being led to Christ because of the believing spouse? Obviously, no one can be saved by the merits of someone else's salvation. So, it's a good question. And what I want to do to get background to this verse and actually to this passage, this whole chapter, Paul is addressing a problem that had cropped up during the first century. You'll remember uh, that the early believers, like the apostles themselves and the people they initially led to Christ and discipled and built churches from, were all Orthodox Jews. That's primarily what the first church consisted of. They're based in Jerusalem, and it grew from a dozen uh, disciples to 120 on the day of Pentecost to 3,000 or more were added that day, and then later on, thousands more were added, and then we got, went, went from addition to multiplication, and the number of the disciples was multiplied, and it grew so large that the Lord brought it necessary, I thought it necessary, I, I believe this is what happened in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, that persecution was brought against the church at Jerusalem. Now, initially, the Lord and his, his angels in Acts chapter 1 told the disciples to stay at Jerusalem until they received power from on high. That happened at the day of Pentecost. After that, there was no mandate to stay at home. There was no stay-at-home order after that. But uh, they continued to stay, and the church continued to grow, and they started building a megachurch there, the world's first megachurch right there in Jerusalem. Uh, but the problem was they weren't winning anybody else to Christ. They were all right there in their hometown of Jerusalem. So as I said a moment ago, I believe the Lord brought persecution against that church and the disciples scattered everywhere except the apostles. The apostles stayed there. Everybody else scattered all over the known world at that time throughout the Roman Empire, winning people to Christ everywhere that they went, establishing other churches, discipling other believers. And in the process of that, uh, Gentiles began to get saved. So much so that in Acts chapter 10, we see the gospel going primarily to the Gentiles from that chapter on and less so to the Jewish people. So what was happening here was that Jewish people primarily, and that's what he's talking about here, were getting saved. And the problem was that in a Jewish household back then, much as in a Muslim household today, if a person in that family goes away from the faith, Judaism then, say Islam now, and I've seen it happen in other religions, even so-called Christian faiths uh, in most more recent decades, that if someone in that household goes away from the family faith, they uh, have split the family. Sometimes they, they have, uh, sometimes they are considered dead to the family. Sometimes they are uh, left behind by the other spouse. The, the one spouse will... will uh, leave them and stay true to the family faith, and, and then they're out cold. And, and th this was one of the initial, oh, 
I, don't, I hate to call it a scandal in the early church, but it was one of the first uh, criticisms against Christianity was that it wrecked family relationships. When someone got saved, it ruined the family. And that's what Paul is addressing here. And that is the larger topic of this chapter. And in order to understand this verse, we need to put it in context of the chapter. In order to understand the chapter, we need to put it in context of its culture and history at the time. And this is what was going on in Jewish families at that time. Uh, a husband was getting saved. The wife was, you know, should I leave? What do I do now? And, and, and so the Christian uh, in that family, and sometimes it was the wife who got saved, and the husband might want to leave, uh, and, or maybe the Christian person in that family thought, well, what should I do now that I'm a Christian? Should I leave them? Because they're not saved, and I'm ruining their relationships with the rest of the family. I'm not getting invited over for Thanksgiving and Christmas anymore, <laughs> uh, and it's making it for a bad family holiday. Should I just go ahead and leave, or should I encourage them to leave? And so that's what Paul is addressing. So let's go back up to... Um, to verse 8. Well, let's go to verse 12. Verse 12, that's, that's far enough back. But to the rest be guy. We won't, we'll just ignore what to the rest he's talking about, what, what before that he's talking about. That's not pertinent to our conversation here. But in verse 12 he says, but to the rest be guy, not the Lord. Now this does not mean, let me throw this in here, this does not mean that Paul's words are any less inspired than Jesus' were. All he's saying is here, this topic that I'm about to address, Jesus did not address when he was on earth in his earthly ministry. I don't know that Paul really realized that his writings were inspired I don't think that was the case, but he's saying, listen, the Lord didn't address this, so I'm going to address it. So I want you to, to understand and not misunderstand that he's not saying, well, the rest of the, this, this New Testament up till now has been inspired, but this part isn't. The reason I'm emphasizing that is because there are many people today who will look at that verse and say, well, this part is not inspired. This part of the Bible, this part of Paul's writings, these are not inspired. The rest of it is, but this one's not because of what he said. That's not what he's talking about. He did not realize when he was writing that any of his writings were inspired. All he's saying is, I'm going to talk about something that Jesus did not address when he was on earth. But this, this applies. This principle applies. That's what he's saying. That's all he's saying. He says, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. It is, if you got saved, your wife's not, not saved, don't dump her. Don't leave her. Don't try to do her a favor. And in some cases, some of those believers were thinking they were actually being more spiritual by getting saved and leaving their unbelieving spouse. And that was a major problem. So he says, don't, don't do that. He says, uh, let him not put her away. Verse 13, and the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For that brings us to verse 14. That puts it in context, okay? He's talking about marriage relationships here. That's the focus. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Now, is he saying there that the unbelieving wife or the unbelieving husband is saved because of the, the other spouse is? No, that's not what he's saying at all. And the, and the person who asked the question says, yeah, that's, it's obvious that uh, no one can be saved by the merits of someone else's salvation. That's absolutely true. What it means by sanctified, and the word sanctified uh, means set apart. It's the same word as holy. Being made holy doesn't mean that you're better than anyone else. doesn't mean you're more righteous than anybody else. It means you're set apart. That's all it means. Set apart from something, set apart to something. That's all it means. So what, he, what Paul is saying here, what he's describing in these words, is that the unbelieving husband or the unbelieving wife in this case is set apart for a special purpose. In this marriage, which is a saved wife, unbelieving husband, or saved husband, unbelieving wife. He's saying that, that they should stay together because there's a special purpose in that. Not that the per other unbelieving person will automatically get saved, but they will be more likely to because they have a, a, a saved spouse who now can witness to them. They will hear the gospel more readily. They will see the gospel in action, assumingly, because the saved person will live like a Christian, this is assumed, <clears throat> and so they will be more likely to get saved. And we've seen this in many households and families in our church over the decades, where one person in the family would get saved and then 
Other ones in the family were not saved at the time, but they would get saved later. Now, let me throw something else in here, which is a little bit off topic. He's not talking about this, this fact, but it is an underlying assumption here in Paul's discussion that a saved person will not marry an unperson. Okay, he's talking about two people who got together and got married when both of them were unsaved. And after they got married, one of them got saved and the other one hadn't yet. That's what he's talking about here. And that's why he uses this argument here in verse 14. He says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified or set apart by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified or set apart by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. All he's talking about here is, listen, you guys got married legitimately. I know you both were unsaved at the time, but it was still a legitimate marriage. Now, if one of you were saved, the other one wasn't, you know, you're not supposed to do that. That's not a legitimate marriage, okay? Unsaved people are not supposed to, supposed to marry saved people. We're not to do that. <clears throat> but you guys had a legitimate marriage. You both were unsaved at the time. Now that one of you is saved, stay in it. Keep it together. And use your Christian influence in the family for your husband or wife or your unbelieving spouse, whichever they are, and your children have a better chance of getting saved too. And what he means by else were your children unclean, all he's saying is if, if you didn't have a legitimate marriage, your children would be illegitimate. That's all he means by that. This is not an argument about children or their spirituality. This is only talking, he's just throwing in this, this in as a comment. He says, you have a legitimate marriage, stay in it. It's not illegitimate because one of you saved, the other one isn't. I know what I said to, uh, in the last chapter that, that uh, saved people shouldn't marry unsaved people. That's true. They shouldn't. But you guys got, got married before this. It's a legitimate marriage. That's all he's saying here. So he's just making the argument, listen, it's a legitimate marriage. Your kids are legitimate. That's, that's really all he's saying. So this has nothing to do with spirituality of the kids. There are some who argue, and I will throw this in here because I always try to give you both sides of an argument and uh, let you, because you're going to find it out for yourself if you're Bible scholars and you're looking up things, and, and you know, I know you are, because I can tell by the questions you're asking me, you guys do studying at home. So you're going to run across an argument in, in some places by some people who will look at that verse and say, well, listen, what this is saying is that Christian families have Christian kids automatically. Those kids are saved automatically. There are some who argue that. That is not what the Bible's teaching. That is not what this verse is teaching. But there are some teachers who will say that. And you will come across that argument. I don't buy it for, for a heartbeat. Uh, what this is talking about is illegitimacy versus legitimacy in, in children of marriages. That's what he's talking about. So that's the only thing that I have to say about that. That's a quote from Forrest Gump. Okay? All right, let me go on to the next question. How should a Christian... Decide which version or translation of the Bible is the best to study. How should a Christian decide which version or translation of the Bible is the best to study? This is related, uh, very similar to a question we had some time back on which is the best Bible version. It's, uh, it's almost the same question. It's not quite. It's, it's, it's uh, how should a Christian decide which version or translation of the Bible is the best to study? So I'm going to cover this topic, and it'll overlap uh, quite a bit with, uh, with one that I, I did uh, some time ago. Um, and it's, it's basically this. There's no one version that should be used to study the Bible to the exclusion of all other vers versions. Uh, there is a lot of different versions out there, and it's a good question. Which one should I study? Which one should I pay the most attention to? Uh, well, when it comes to studying the Bible, there's, there's, there's only one that I use to preach and teach from. You all know that. Uh, but when I, when I study uh, for different lessons and, and messages, as I did with this one, um, before I come here with the one version that I always use, I always look at other versions. There's never a time when I don't look at other versions. Now, used to be uh, in the olden days that I would have different versions uh, on my table or, or my desk uh, and be opening this one and then opening that one opening that one, uh, and it would take forever. Nowadays, it's a whole lot easier. Uh, <laughs> now that we've got computers, and there's a whole plethora of software available free to you. You don't even have to buy it. Uh, I remember when uh, computers first came out, personal computers first came out, you had to buy software. You had to buy different commentaries. You had to buy different, uh, like, treasury scripture knowledge or uh, Strong's Concordance or different commentaries and things of that nature. Now it's all free. It's amazing. It's wonderful. You, you can get the, a vast library of things that 
that we in Bible college had to pay hundreds of dollars for uh, 40 years ago when things were cheap. You still had to pay a whole lot of money for this stuff. Uh, but you can get it anywhere. Just, just bring up a verse on your Bible screen and click, and you can choose whatever version you like, and it will show you that exact same version, uh, that verse in different versions. And what it does is it allows you to get a more full meaning of what that passage is actually saying. Um, because the version I use, which I think is a very, very good version, uh, will not always get across the exact view that, uh, that I think the, the verse is actually trying to communicate. And so when I look at other versions, I can do that. You can even go on, e without any theological background at all, you can, you can bring that same verse up in Hebrew or Greek. You can click on specific words, and it will take you back to the original language, and it will define it for you and to explain to you exactly what that word meant in the original language. You can look that stuff up for yourself. <coughs> and when you do that, when you look up uh, a, a verse in, in Hebrew or Greek, you are looking at other versions. And when it comes to, uh, like, an English version, the English version I'm, I'm using, <coughs> which, as I said a, a few moments ago, it's the only one I teach and preach out of, if this was all I used, there'd be a whole lot that I would be missing because this is a translation of the original. Um, the writers of the Bible did not write it in English. They wrote it in Hebrew. They wrote it in Aramaic. They wrote it in Chaldean in some, some places. They wrote it in, in Greek. Uh, and in order for me to understand what it's saying, I cannot rely just on this. <coughs> now, this is also something you will not hear everybody teach. There are some who will say, this is the only thing you should ever use. It's the only one that's perfect. It's the only one inspired. It's the only one that God wants us to use. That's not true. Uh, what, what he wants us to do is study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's 1 Timothy 2.15. That was Paul ad, ad, Paul's admonition to a young pastor, uh, and it's our, our admonition as well. It applies to each of us. We should not only read the Bible, we should study it, and in studying, we should gather as much information as we can from different sources in much the same way as we would, say, with history. Uh, when, I, when I study history and I'm looking at a, a, a topic or a specific era or an event, I don't just look at one person's view of what that event is. I look at as many different views from as many different angles as I can so I can get a full 360-degree picture of what happened at that event, who was involved, why it happened, th what happened behind the scenes, what was obvious, what was not obvious, and it's the same way with Scripture. <clears throat> so we need to do that. Now, having said that, there are a number of different versions that, I, uh, th that are available. I've handed this out before. I'm going to hand it out again tonight because it's a very, very valuable chart. There are some versions I would not recommend because I don't, I don't think they're good to use. They're not easy to use. Those would be versions that are literally word-for-word -word translations from Hebrew into English or Greek into English. If you were to get one of those, you'd have a really, really hard time understanding it. And then on the other end of the spectrum are versions that are actually commentaries. It's what somebody else thinks the Bible is actually saying. And those things are easy to understand, but you can't trust them because it's just one person's viewpoint of what the Scripture says. As with almost everything else, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. The best is in the middle, not the extremes. And so that's the case with Bible versions as well. And every Bible version out there, and this has a, most of the... the most popular translations, it tells you where on the spectrum from, from word to word, word for word, literal transformation on this side to paraphrases and commentaries on this side. Um, so I would, I'm going to hand these out to you or make these available to you in just a few minutes and encourage you, when you go to Bible, use a Bible uh, translation, uh, this will tell you where on that spectrum it is. So I would recommend choosing one that's a little bit more toward the word for word and uh, because that's going to be more accurate. You want, the, the key is to find one that's, that's as, as accurate as possible, wor, um, as far over to word for word as possible, that's also easy to understand. So you want to start over here and then pull back until you can understand it, and that's where you should go. Where you, should go. you never want to start on this side. You want to start over here uh, at the most difficult ones, which is an interlinear, uh, which I use 
every time I study it. And what it is, it's, it's Hebrew and Greek, and it has the... It didn't have the sound effect like that, but it has the, the word-for-word -word translation underneath it, but it's out of order than the way we usually talk. So it's, it's the most difficult to understand, but it's, but it's the most accurate. All right, we'll stop there, and we'll get to the last question next week. Uh, and we'll go to your comments and questions. And we've got a number of live, live people here tonight, but if you have a question online, feel free to type it in. We're watching the screen, and we will relay your questions tonight. For the people at home, is there a URL link for that chart? Is there a what? Um, a web link for that uh, chart you were showing? Let, let's do one right now. Uh, hang on. I can zoom in on it. Hang on. <laughs> no, it, uh, for those of you at home, we, will, we can make this available to you. Um, if you. If you want us to send it to you, we can. If you want us to bring it to you, we can. If there's a way to post it on there. I don't know if there's a way to post it on Facebook, is there? Okay. Where they can enlarge it and see it? Because I don't know if it'll be readable. What I'll do is I'll um, scan Because if, if you put this down to the Facebook size, it won't be readable. I'll scan it, and then I'll post it in the church, church's page. Okay, in the church's page. But, but I mean, if we put it down the size of, of Facebook, will it still be readable? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll, what I'll do is I'll put a link in there to, uh, if, in case they want to access the actual okay. file. Okay. Very good. We'll make it available to you one way or another. We'll put it on there, and then we'll mail you a magnifying glass. So Janet asked in the chat, um, when you preach from K, uh, King James Version, are you concerned that there are people in the audience who either don't understand what you are reading or perhaps feel alienated by the language? Okay. Um, for example, uh, to a teenager or a 20-something-year-old, because KJV can make about as much sense as having service in Latin. Okay. It's a good question. And before I answer that, congratulations, Dr. Janet Adeboye. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Congratulations to you. We're very proud of you. Um, but uh, it's a very good question. And if, if you were to um, uh, blank out the words King James Version and put any other version in there, the rest of the question would be equally as legitimate. It doesn't matter what uh, version that we speak or preach out of, and, and you're right, King James Version is, is the only one I use to teach or preach in, uh, but um, every time we teach or preach, no matter what version that we use, and I've, I've got a number of friends who use other versions in their pulpits to teach or preach from, every single one of us reads the passage and then has to explain it and apply it. That's true no matter what version that we use, uh, because it's, each, each one is going to communicate a different aspect of the truth contained in that verse, and, um, and so, so it's, it's necessary to read it. I'm, I'm trying to think of the passage in mind. But back in, in um, it's either Ezra or Nehemiah, and I'm drawing a blank on the chapter, but uh, either Ezra or Nehemiah got the people together. It seems like it was Ezra. They got the people together, and they held a service. It was during the pouring rain. And people stood there all day in the rain. Some of you guys will probably remember which passage I'm talking about. <clears throat> but what, the, what Ezra and the other teachers who were there on the pulpit did was they read the passage from the Scripture. Of course, they were opening a scroll rather than a book. Read, reading the passage, and then they gave the sense of the reading. In other words, what they did then is exactly what we do now. We will read a passage and then explain what it means and apply the truths and principles of that passage to the listeners in the congregation and those online as well. So uh, as I said, that would be the case no matter what version that we use. Uh, and it is, it is uh, undoubtedly true that the younger people would have a less time understanding uh, the King James Version rather than those of us who grew up with it. Uh, but then uh, on the other hand, you would have uh, churches, and I, as I said, I know other pre preachers who, who use other versions uh, like the Net Bible, the NET Bible, <coughs> or the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, both of which are, are great translations. The Holman Christian Standard Bible is another one that I recommend. Those churches who use that, and even more liberal translations, like the New Living Translation, um, they, would, they will have a tendency to, to communicate maybe easier with the younger people, but confuse the older people and still have to explain it to them as well. And so no matter what we do, we, we have to read it and we have to explain it and apply it. So, but it's an excellent question. 
So in, in that respect, um, do you think it would be wise to still have the paraphrase versions like the message or the NIV to maybe if you're not understanding the way that um, you know, the KJV puts it, you know, maybe a paraphrase might offer a word or might, might use a different word that might enlighten you? Like, would you recommend using multiple versions to try to get an understanding of a passage that seems unclear? Of course, you know, along with you know, prayer and meditation and, um, you know, I guess, I guess the question, the main question is, is there a benefit to those paraphrase translations? Uh, not for me. I stay away from the paraphrases entirely. The ones at the far, uh, as you look at the page, the far right end of the spectrum, <coughs> I, I avoid those entirely because, as I uh, mentioned, those are someone else's opinion of what the scripture says. They're not translations. By the, by the very phrase itself, a paraphrase, and you're right, they are paraphrases. Uh, anytime you paraphrase something, you are putting your own spin on it, which is what preachers do. When we read the scripture and then we uh, say, in other words, it says this, we're paraphrasing it. So you're getting our opinion on it. Uh, so but, so I, what I don't try to do, what I don't like to do is, is quote somebody else's paraphrase because you're getting their, their opinions, opinions in on it. Um, the NIV is not a paraphrase, it is a, and it's not a word for word, it's more of a thought by thought translation. It kind of falls in the middle on that spectrum there. But I do recommend using uh, all kinds of other translations as much as possible and other commentaries, which is other people's opinions. And so when I do that and I find various opinions on something, I do what I did tonight and I will give you different opinions. I will say this person thinks this, this person thinks that. I didn't give you names tonight of uh, who, who thinks that, um, um, for example, when, when uh, um, Christian parents have kids, that their kids are automatically saved. I didn't say who believes that, but there, there are some you'll come across that will. They're in the they're minority, but you will come across some of those that do that, and I don't think it's necessary to give their names here. But that's one viewpoint, and as I said, it's not one that I hold, but I will try to give you different viewpoints so you know what's out there and what you're going to run into when you do Bible study on your own. So um, I, I stay away from the paraphrases. Uh, I, I keep the, the opinions within the commentaries, and I know this guy is going to have this view, this guy is going to have a different view, that guy is going to have a different view. Those are commentaries, but I don't want to get it from Scripture because I don't, or so-called Scripture paraphrases, because... Uh, how can I say this? I don't, I don't want that version of the passage to get in my head, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is the only one I try to memorize. Um, but I will read other versions, uh, and, and those, some of those, sometimes those thoughts will get in my head, <clears throat> and they're okay because they, they're, they are in line with what the passage says, but I don't want the paraphrase in there. Let, let me give you an example, because I know it's, it's kind of, what I'm saying is kind of fuzzy. Let me put it in, more clearly. In, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, uh, the King James, I believe, says, be anxious for nothing. But when you look at other versions, it will say, um, yeah, be careful for nothing. That's, that's the other main uh, word, be careful for nothing. Now, when I read that, uh, which is the newer version, uh, Dr. Janet, if you're listening, uh, if I use that version and say, be careful for nothing, I still have to explain that because the word careful does not mean in that passage what we think it means when we use the word careful. Uh, when I tell you, be careful walking over that carpet, you don't want to trip over those wires back there. Uh, that's what we normally understand that word to mean. But in that verse, in that version, it does not mean careful. It means full of care. Uh, which is more along the lines of be anxious for nothing, don't be stressed, don't be worried, which are other versions as well. So those versions are stuck in my head, and sometimes I, I, I switch back and forth. Sometimes I'll say be anxious for nothing. Sometimes I'll be, say be careful for nothing. Uh, they both mean the same thing. But, those are, but I don't know what a paraphrase would say. I just don't want it in my head because it might say something entirely different. Does that make sense? have one. Um, aren't there some versions that that will omit 
certain verses because it does not fit with their their thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, that happens with uh, with a number of of, of versions, and um, it's one of the reasons I don't like some of the versions. For example, the NIV. For example, there, there's a, there's a lot of verses in there, in our Bible that are not in the NIV. Now, you could go back to uh, the translation issue and go back to old manuscripts and things of that sort, and they have a good explanation as to why those verses are not in there. I like to give the Lord the benefit of the doubt uh, and keep those verses in rather than deciding, well, the last half of Matthew, or I mean, the last half of Mark chapter 16 shouldn't be in there. The chapter should, should end at verse 9 and, and verse 10 and after should not be in there, which you'll find in NIV, that chapter is not in there. Uh, there are uh, numerous other verses in the NIV that are not there that I think, um, I think should be. Um, but, you, but I don't want to get into a big translation argument. They use a different family of manuscripts than this one does. And, so it, when, and, it, and I think it's confusing to use that. When you go through your Bible and you're reading a passage... Uh, say even on your own, not even in a, a group setting like this where I'm reading through it and then you, 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 uh, you're looking around saying, well, wait a minute, he just read something that's not in my Bible. That's confusing enough. But when you're at home and reading through your Bible and you get to say, say Acts chapter 8 and you're reading down to verse 36 and all of a sudden you jump down to verse 38 and you say, wait a minute, there's a typo here. They, they didn't number this right. Verse 37 is missing. And then you look around, and down at the bottom of the page, in very, very fine print, there's an asterisk with an explanation saying verse 37 is not in the most ancient manuscripts. Um, and that's the part that explains why the Ethiopian eunuch was getting baptized in the first place, because he got saved. He, he made a profession of faith in Christ, and, and that's why he got baptized. Otherwise, if you take that verse out, it sounds like he got baptized in order to be saved. So those verses, are, I think, are important, and it's it's confusing if they're going to eliminate those verses, why, why just eliminate the verse number? Because uh, it makes it confusing. You, don't you feel like you're, you're missing something there? Uh, and, it, and that happens uh, in numerous places, not just with whole verses or whole chapters, but with, say, a, a half a verse here or a half a verse there is missing. And I, I, just, I just avoid that whole translation, that, that whole version out. And it's interesting because it's one of the most popular versions around and required by a number of Christian schools, uh, which I think just leads to confusing kids and confusing Christians. I've had a whole lot of people. I have more questions about that version than any other version of my entire ministry in the last 45 years. And so I just avoid it. Just avoid the questions, avoid the problems. Just don't use that one. It's just too hard to explain why it's uh, the way it is. I was wondering um, what your thoughts are on there's supposed to be like several different books that were written but are not included in the Bible that we use. Like mm -hmm. I think one of them was like the Epistle of Barnabas, the Gospel of Thomas, things mm -hmm. like that. What are your thoughts on that and why or why not? I mean, just how did they come to be written but not included and mm -hmm. what's the logic behind that? Okay. Well, that's a, that's a big topic. Uh, it's one that we can, uh, could discuss in a future 2020-2020. And actually, we'll probably take a couple of sessions to do, to do that one and do it justice. But let me just quickly say that there are different categories of books like that in the Old Testament and the New Testament that look like Scripture, maybe sound like Scripture, but are not in our Bible. Why are they in this Bible and they're not in that Bible? And uh, let me just say primarily, the first books that come to mind are the Apocrypha of the Catholic Bible. There's 10 extra books in their Old Testament that's not in ours. And uh, so... You would ask yourself, why do they have more books? And they would say, why don't you guys have these books in your Bible? Well, um, to answer that, we'd really have to go back and discuss some church history and some of the early church councils where they decided what books were going to be included in the canon of books in both the Old Testament and New Testament. There were different criteria that they used to decide that, uh, and different, different councils used different criteria. But some of the books that, uh, that were considered for inclusion did not meet the criteria. Uh, and were, those are called apocrypha. There's other ones, they've got fancy names like pseudepigrapha and, and things of that sort. But 
a simple answer would be uh, that the Christians back in the first century, like the Epistle of Barnabas you're talking about, there's numerous other ones too, the Shepherd of Hermas and other very, various uh, things. There were a number of people in the early uh, church who would write letters to each other, as Paul did. He wrote letters back to the churches as he was traveling. He would write letters back to this church and ask them to read it and then pass it on to the next church, and some of them did that anyway. But he, he would write it to individuals as well, like Titus and Philemon. Um, and First John, uh, well, actually, that was Second John and Third John were written to individuals. For example, personal letters. Well, if you and I were to write personal letters to different people in our church, or maybe pen pals in other churches that we know, and include Christian references and talk about how much we love the Lord or how great the service was, and talk about how we li we like that preacher over there or this this that and the other one, why aren't those in the scripture? Because that's really the same question. Because they wrote letters to each other. And they sounded flowery, they sounded uh, scriptural, they quoted different passages, they talked about spiritual things. Why weren't those all in the Bible? Well, uh, that's, a, that's the question. We have to draw a line and say, well, why are the books in our Bible in the Bible, and why weren't these books included in the Bible? And that's essentially the question that you're asking. And so that's a, that's a pretty major topic. And it's, it's one that would uh, take some time and it'd take additional study for me because it's been a long time since I studied that. Okay. So for me to uh, explain it thoroughly off the top of my head, I couldn't do one for sake of time and also because I'm not up to date on okay. my reasons. Okay. Um, but the, but they, they went through a thorough process in, in coming up with those. And as, what's interesting is that there are some books in our Bible that that uh, we would not think meet that criteria today. Uh, the book of Esther, for example, nowhere mentions God. No mention of him at all. There's no mention of prayer in that book at all, either. Uh, there's, there's just very little spiritual <laughs> in there. <clears throat> and, we, and we think, well, how come this book made it in when this one over here didn't make it in? The book of Enoch, for example. Book of Jasher, for example. They're both mentioned in the Old Testament, but why aren't they part of it? Uh, it's a good question. It gets really interesting. But uh, I think we would agree that there's very few books in the Old Testament that are more spiritual than the book of East Esther, even though God is not mentioned and prayer is not mentioned. But it's, uh, it's a very spiritual book. But they, uh, they, they had ways of figuring that out. Okay. If you'll write it down, that will remind me to okay. include that in a future sure. uh, session. Also, um, and I'm just going to throw this out there. I mean, some people will get saved using an NIV Bible. Some will get saved using a KJV. This is not to invalidate their salvation if they were using a different Bible, correct? Correct. Correct. Uh, at least I would hope not. Uh, let me just give you a personal story about that. Um, <clears throat> I used to be a King James only person. Uh, when I first got saved and started coming to this church, uh, my youth director here was an adamant KGBO guy, King James only. Don't use anything else. And, uh, and so that's where I started. That stuck with me to this day. When I went off to Bible college, same thing. I got uh, connected with uh, folks and teachers there who were the same way, King James only. It's the only English version. Um, when I got saved, though, uh, when I got the tract on the street corner, took it home and went home and uh, got out my Bible that was given to me when I was confirmed in the Methodist church, um, I opened that tract and looked at the verses in the tract, and then I opened up the Bible that I was given by my Methodist church, and I read the verses in my Bible with the verses in the tract, and they said the same thing. Now, the words weren't exact, but they said the same thing, okay? I got saved that night. Now, keep in mind, let's fast forward um, 20 years, okay? Uh, there, the, the, the King James only movement is still going today, strong in some circles. And in the early 90s, there were some preachers that I ran across who said that if you weren't saved out of the King James Bible, then you're not saved. Hmm. Well, that made me really think. I thought, not about my salvation, but about my Bible version. I thought, man... 
if they are that <laughs> strong on a King James Version, then <clears throat> if you didn't get saved out of a King James Version then, and you're not saved, maybe I really, really ought to think, rethink my position on the King James Version because I know I'm saved and I got saved out of an RSV, not a KJV. Okay? So that made me really question the doctrine, the teaching of King James only. Um, and and I, I've concluded, and I'm going to shorten this up a lot because the buzzer went off, but the King James only movement to me is a cult. And it worships the Bible version rather than the Bible and the, and the Lord, uh, which is where the focus should be. Um, and so I, I reject that entirely. Now, and that's odd for so, someone who only uses the King James Version to teach and preach. But uh, th they would say, if you don't believe that this is the Word of God, infallible, without question, uh, then, then you're not saved. You, you've got the wrong Bible. Uh, but even the translators of this version, who translated it from 1604 to 1611, uh, they said it's not perfect. They, they admitted they had mistakes in here. Now, they are not mistakes that affect the translation, I mean, as far as the, the doctrine that it teaches. But there are some things in here, as with any book, you know, I'm a writer, I'm a publisher, and, and every single time I write something, it has to be proofed. I cannot proof my own stuff. There's going to be mistakes in there. And if you were to pick up different copies of the King James Version, uh, and, and I've got versions, and for, for years and years, the only two versions I would use are the Cambridge uh, print, uh, the versions printed by the University of Cambridge in England, and the University of Oxford in England, okay? Um, you know, it's a British book. King James was a British king. You know, they were the ones who could print the Bible, the Oxford and the Cambridge, and they don't match. They're not the same. You'll find differences in between those two different versions in the way that they, they uh, spelled some things, and I think I found even a, a word or two somewhere that was different. Uh, so even within that, you know, it's not perfect, okay? So anyway, if, uh, if, if you're not saved after uh, getting saved out of an NIV, NIV or an RSV or an NASB or something else, uh, then I'm in trouble because uh, I got saved out of an, a revised standard version um, and I know I got saved. So you can get saved out of a King James or an RSV or NIV. It's not the version. It's not what you pray. It's what you believe in your heart. It's the object of your faith. And I sure hope that a translation is not the object of your faith. So, anyway, with that, I owe you three minutes. Okay? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for being the God that you are and loving us as you do and for protecting us and providing for us. I ask, Lord, that you would continue to do that. Thank you, Father, for the way you've kept our families and our church families safe during this time of fear. I pray, Lord, that you'd Help uh, each of us to trust in you and you only for all the things that we need. And Father, I pray that you would take away the fear that is running rampant around the world. And I pray, Lord, that it would not come to the shores of our families and our church. Father, may our trust always, always be in you and in, in you alone. I pray that you bless us, protect us, provide for us until we meet again. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake and with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you. Good night. We'll see you again Wednesday. We'll do the Wednesday we'll, uh, service will be um, live streamed, okay? Live streamed on Wednesday night. God bless you. We'll see you.